Amen. We're on a journey. Amen. Everybody say a journey. Amen. We're on a journey from this land to another land far beyond the sky. To some, this, this traveling, this road, this journey has not been easy, but no matter how difficult the road is, doesn't matter how hard it seems, it's going to be worth it all. There's a song that says it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials, and we all have life's trials, and they're going to seem so small when we see Jesus. Amen. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow is going to erase. So bravely run this race until we see Christ. When we compare our spiritual walk with the physical walk of the children of Israel of the Old Testament, and understand, I've said this many times, uh, the Old Testament was things that happened physically, but they impart a spiritual truth in the New Testament. Uh, amen. So uh, when you compare the children of Israel leaving Egypt, it's compared to us, uh, amen, leaving the world, and we're on this trail, this journey to a promised land, much like they were on, amen, a journey to Canaan or the promised land. Amen. But when you read and study about them walking through the wilderness, uh, amen, I am not sure and I have no documentation. I only have my mind's imagination. Amen. I'm not sure how many days or how many times they can say their walk was easy. Think about it. It's like 130 degrees outside and you're walking in the sand. At night, it's cooling off, but it gets really, really cold. As today's world struggles with climate change and the concept of, uh, of climate change and their focus on global warming and all that, uh, I'm sure that in the middle of the desert, uh, amen, the heat would have been so hot, uh, amen, that it would be very, very uncomfortable, amen, for them. As with any desert, uh, amen, the comforts of life would have been left behind. Uh, gone were the streets filled with vendors, uh, amen, of fast foods and, and, and instant drinks. Uh, gone would have been the luxuries, uh, amen, uh, of life and comforts, uh, amen, of life. Gone would be the variety of meals uh, and entertainment that they in, uh, enjoyed, amen, before they left uh, Egypt. Uh, instead, they were trudging up and down sand dunes. Uh, it would have been sand in their sandals, sand, amen, in their eyes, sand in their ears. We go to the beach. I don't like beaches, but, you know, we, we go there and enjoy the beach because uh, the hot sand, but you live in it, it's no longer nice. Amen, the sand everywhere to the point it brings irritation, bad attitude, and miserableness. Their food consisted of manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna for supper. And then that changed to quail, quail, and more quail. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't know what would be around the next corner, not knowing what they'd have to face the next day. But what kept them going was the Lord said, I've got a land for you filled with milk and honey. I've got a promised land, amen, for you, waiting for you that, that Father Abraham encountered and where he walked, I gave it to him for you. Our walk may not always be a walk in the park. It may not always be what we want. Amen. We may feel like we're trudging up and down the sand dunes. I don't know if you've ever walked in sand dunes. I have. It's not easy. We may feel under pressure. Amen. We may feel irritation. Anybody ever feel that irritation? Anybody ever get miserable? We may not understand what tomorrow is. We're, we're going through a situation we don't know. Amen. What the next hour is, let alone what tomorrow is. But God said, stay on the journey. He says, stay in the journey. There's a land, a promised land. It's dedicated. It's not dedicated to anybody else. It's dedicated to you, the child of God. Amen. And nobody else. And it's going to be, amen, worth it all. Some beautiful, beautiful 
day. Every day that we live, we face choices. Uh, amen. Which road do I take? Which direction do I go? Uh, even the slightest deviation will lead to disaster if I'm not careful. Uh, amen. E even the slightest change in what I'm doing, uh, amen, uh, could change the outcome, uh, amen, down the road. Uh, I may do something today and, and not feel the effects today and think, ah, oh, I made it, uh, and find out a month later I should have. I don't know, I, I think I mentioned this before when I was teaching the cadets about compass bearing and all those things. Uh, half a degree from here, e even to the uh, end of the street, is not much. Uh, but half a degree will throw an airplane into some other country. To our benefit, amen, to my benefit. Everybody say my benefit. God has provided us with help. So he's given us a manual called the Word of God. Amen. Jesus said in Luke, blessed are they that, that hear the Word of God and keep it. There's a lot of people that hear the Word of God. Amen. There's a lot of people that listen to the Word of God. A lot of people that read their Bibles faithfully, but they don't keep it. They don't hide it in their heart. And Jesus said, blessed are they that not only hear the word, but they keep the word and they follow after the same word. Amen. God gave us instructors, and I'm not saying that because I'm here. Amen. But Paul said this, God gave some apostles and prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. He has given us insight. Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Surely the Lord will do nothing but reveals His secret to His servants of prophets. Isn't God good? I don't know the road, but I do have some instruction. Amen. He's given us promises. Amen. Second Peter chapter one, verse three, according as his divine power is given to us, all things pertain into life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I'm glad, amen, that I've got a promise, not from you, amen, not from my wife, not from somebody. I've got a promise from God who does not lie. Amen, He's given us hope in a world that is so dark and lost hope. Amen, Romans chapter 5, Paul wrote to the church. He said, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also. You see, I've got this hope, and this hope says whatever our tribulation I'm going through, uh, I'm still hanging on to this hope because tribulation works patience. See, even the things we don't like, understand, or know about, uh, they work towards us and for us. Patience gives us experience. Experience gives us the hope. Hope makes us not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. Aren't you glad this morning you've got a hope? I mean, you're walking this desert lonely way. Amen. And it's hot and miserable and sometimes irritating. And everything that somebody says, contrary to your mind, irritates you. Does anybody know Brother Merkel? We all know Brother Merkel from Huntsville. I think I shared this, and I hope she wa his wife watches. But I remember driving with him in Bible school, and I, I was just going through such a bad time. It wasn't a day. It was like three or four days of just badgering things against me. And we're driving down the road, and, and, and you know, I'm just fuming within, just, just jittery, just shaking. And he goes, oh, brother, the Lord will take care of it. <laughs> You know, if he wasn't driving, I wanted to drive him. Because I didn't want to hear that. I wanted to hear him say, oh, brother, this is how we get out of it. Oh, brother, you know, oh, no, no. Oh, no, the Lord will take care of it. Just in that calm, 
cool, I don't care voice. Almost condescending, but he wasn't. I'm going to be honest. It irritated my flesh. It irritated. Come on, folks. You come to church sometimes, you just riled up, and the preacher preaches and just gets right to you, and you want to throttle? Anybody? Samuel, you're not supposed to agree with that. <laughs> you're supposed to say, Pastor, no, not you. Bawani. Bawani, Pastor. Bawani. Oh, I'm so glad that we have this hope. I I'm going to make a statement here that it does not negate the power of God. It doesn't negate the ability of God. It does not wipe out the promises of God. So, so please hear it. It doesn't cancel, amen, it doesn't cancel out faith and it doesn't cancel out our faith in God. Over the years, I have told my kids and other people that you cannot rely on what might take place. You can't rely on somebody's promise. You can't rely on somebody's hope that they may have or a hope you might have. You, we all say it, I, you know, I hope this happens. You can't rely on that. I'm not talking specifically about spiritual things because a lot of it is physical things too, but I'm including spiritual things. Example, if somebody's out looking for a job and they go hand out a resume, they've got to hand out more than one resume. Because if you hope you're going to get a job from one resume, you are in trouble. The very first company might say, we're hiring and we're going to call you. Anybody hear that before? You're exactly what we need. And I'll call you in a couple days. And the phone never rings. The second company may fawn all over you and make you feel good. But it doesn't mean you're guaranteed to have the job. Your friend may be giving you high regard and high recommendation, but you don't have the job until you sign the contract. Well, what's that got to do spiritually? God has given us, amen, he has given us all things pertaining to this life and the life to come. He has forgiven and washed away our sin. He has filled us with his spirit, and I'm so glad I, I've had my sins washed away, and I'm so glad. Amen. He's filled me with the Spirit. And like Paul says, I'm so glad I can talk in tongues, maybe or maybe not more than you all. I'm glad of that. Although he's done all those things for us, there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee we're going to cross into that promised land called heaven. God called Israel out of Egypt. He performed miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, amen, uh, to get them, just to get them out of Egypt. He subdued armies, changed poison water into real water, supplied their food, their clothing, their lodging. He supplied the fire at night and the cloud by night. He gave them everything, but it was still not a guarantee for them to cross over the Jordan River. They had to keep the walk walking. We have to keep walking. We have to keep living. We have to keep keeping on. We have to make it. I cannot rely on the, pro no offense, I'm, and again, I'm not taking away from God, but I cannot rest my spirit and, and my salvation on the promises of God. I've got to live according to the promises. God said he'd forgive my sins and make me white as snow. But if I go out and sin, amen, I'm breaking the promises of God. He said he'll be with me all the time right to the end. But if I don't listen to him, what good is he with me? That got no amens. You see, there's times, and we know this, there's times we're going to fail God. 
There are times when we are going to be discouraged and not walk anymore. There's times when temptation will seem so strong that we fall into temptation. And if you've never been there, you're lying. You know it, and I know it, but the Lord also knows it. Does he like it? No. Amen. Does he feel good about it? Absolutely not. Does he judge you at that time? No. But what he does is he makes provision, amen, for his children to come in and find rest in him. Amen, find that place where the sweet spirit of God and that rest can sweep over our soul. That our rest can make us complete again, again, and again. He opens the door for restitution. He makes a way, amen, that we can make it. Hallelujah, aren't you glad this morning of the the mercy and the love of God that when I fall short of his glory he is there to pick me up and hold me and carry me and bring me back where I ought to be it's not a license to sin God forbid but it is a door that I can step through into the presence of God and let him sweep over me it doesn't matter what I've done there is no sin so great that God cannot forgive he will, he will forgive us, amen, and wash our sins away. When we cry out to Him, He will give us peace beyond measure. In our quest series, last week we began looking at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Talk about our lifestyle, our conversation, amen, our self-direction towards our flesh, amen, because whatever takes place in or around us, amen, the Lord will be there all the time. Amen, Matthew recorded when Jesus said that he'll be with us right to the end. We can find solace in all that. But the reason for the attitude was that we can boldly see Hey, the Lord is my helper. If I hire somebody or or, uh, I I got Brother Tim to build the pulpit and I'm standing over his shoulder. No, no, don't cut it like that. No, no, don't put it there. Put it like this. Let me show you. Let me tell you how to do it. Let me do it. Watch me. You laugh. You laugh. (laughs) But hear me. Tim is no longer my helper. He's no longer my helper. I'm doing it. Spiritual application here. If I'm doing things my way, the way I want them done, the way I think it is, amen, the way I determine the Lord no longer is my helper because I am on my own, amen. So when I can turn around, amen, have this attitude of forgetting about myself like I talked about last week, amen, and focus outward instead of inward, then I can truly say the Lord is my helper. Job said this, he said, when I came into this world, I came naked. And when I leave this world, I'm going to leave the same manner. Paul spoke to Timothy, wrote to Timothy. He said, we brought nothing in the world. And when we leave, we have nothing to take with us. Technically, both men are right. Yet technically, they're both wrong. Oh, pastor, you're just beating up on scripture. No, I'm not. You see, we entered the world empty. Did anybody have anything with them? We came in the world lost. Amen. But when we leave the world, we can leave the greatest, amen, inheritance, the greatest of riches. We leave this world with our salvation. Hallelujah. So no, I'm not going to leave the world empty. I'm going to, Lord willing, I'm going to carry my salvation with me. Not only my salvation, but those around me, I can take them with me. I mean, the thing that we have to understand is we've got to make sure that we're ready when the Lord calls. Whether it ends up by, by just transformation in this life into the rapture or we go by, by way of the grave, it doesn't matter. We've got to be ready. 
We talk much about the power of God, about the glory of God, but God has given us other things to help us, amen, place upon our lives to make this journey a success. You see, He wants it successful too. How many want to make heaven their home? Of course. Amen. You want it, but you know what? He wants it a whole lot more than you. How do you know, Pastor? Because sometimes I choose a different road. Lord has never chosen the road, amen, that benefits him. It's always for our salvation. Instead of ending up a statistic of spiritual failure, the Lord has made provision for his people to make eternity a success. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness. His long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then, everybody say seeing. Seeing then that all these things have been dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy, in all holy conversation and godliness? Again, there's a conversation, lifestyle, and devotion. Looking for, everybody say looking for. Sometimes we stop looking for. Sometimes we stop looking for and we start looking at. We see what's ahead of us. We see what's around us, but we're not looking for the answer. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blame. We need to understand, church, that everything that the Lord has done for us, amen, since the time of Adam through the Old Testament, amen, through him coming as a babe in a manger, amen, to the cross, to his death, burial, resurrection, amen, through the New Testament, everything was not so people could say, look at the glory of God. It wasn't so people would look and say, majesty, majesty, amen, great God he is. No, amen, it was all done that you and I would not be lost in sin, amen, and cast out in judgment into the pit designed for Satan, amen, and his fallen angels. It was all done for the salvation of your soul and my soul, amen, that as Peter said, may we may be found in peace without spot and blameless. You see, we can't, we know this. We can't stand on our own. Amen. Jesus made a way for us. Amen. Only if we choose. And this morning, amen. Well, that's the introduction. This morning, I want us to take a journey. We're going to go back into the Old Testament. And where God spoke to Joshua and made some provisions for Joshua. Amen. You understand the wilderness was, like I said, a, a typology of our walk with God. Amen. And, and when they crossed the Jordan into the promised land, we're walking into a promised land. That's not necessarily totally true. You see, when they got into the promised land, amen, they still had to fight battles. They still had to take care of business. They still had to live for God. They still had to set examples. They, they still had to congregate as a people. So I would liken, amen, the promised land to our relationship when we come into the church. That God has given us the earnest of our inheritance. He's poured out His Spirit. Amen. He's with us all the time. He's empowering and enabling us. Joshua chapter 20 and verse 1 says this. The Lord also spoke to Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint out of you cities of refuge. Whereof I spake unto you by the hand of Moses, that the slayer that kills any person unawares and unwittingly may flee thither, that they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. And when he that doth flee unto one of those cities shall stand at the entering of the gate of that city and shall declare his cause in the ears of the elders of the city, that they shall make him... They shall take him into the city unto them and give him a place that he may dwell among them. 
And if the avenger of blood pursue after him, then they shall not deliver the slayer up to his hand because he smote his neighbor unwittingly and, and hated him not before time. And he shall dwell in that city until he stand before the congregation for judgment and until the death of the high priest that shall be in those days. Then shall the slayer return and come to his own city, unto his own house, into the city from whence he fled. And they opened, uh, they appointed Kadesh in Galilee, in Mount Naphtali, and Shechem in Mount Ephraim, and Ker Kerjath Arba, which is Hebron, in the mountain of Judah. And on the other side, Jordan, by Jericho, Eastward, they assigned Bezer in a wilderness upon the plain out of the tribe of Reuben, and Ramoth in Gilead out of the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan out of the tribe of Manasseh. And these were the cities appointed for all the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourned among them, that whosoever killeth any person at unawares might flee thither and not die by the hand of the avenger of blood until he stood before the congregation. I, I want to make a point here that really, really stands out. These cities, uh, they're all in the promised land. And that's important. I mean, I'll tell you why it's important. They were not located near Egypt. When they came out of Egypt, they didn't have these cities of refuge. I mean, they, they, they were not needed at that time. But as they entered the promised land, God made provision for them Amen, of his blessing and his mercy. The Lord knew as the children drew near and even after they crossed into the promised land, they're going to need not only power and promise, we live on power and promise, but they're going to need real-time provision to help them when they fall and they fail. The six cities of refuge were distributed through the kingdom of Israel in the north and the kingdom of Judah in the south. Along both sides of the Jordan River, Kadesh, Shechem, and Hebron were to the west of the Jordan. Golan, Ramoth, Gilead, and Bezer were to the east of the Jordan River. These cities were strategically, uh, and just a little bit of history here, I know it's boring, but they're strategically placed in order that they can be safely reached within a one-day journey. They were also offered asylum for foreigners who were in the land. The roads, and we talk about all the roads in our, our country, our nation, our, you know, how rough they are. These roads were well maintained so that the people coming to the cities, that they didn't have trucks and cars, they walked. But they were maintained to ensure a smooth passage for the fugitive. They were clearly marked around every corner. There was a pointer or a, or a name or a sign saying uh, that, that here is the city of refuge. Amen. It, it read Mikla, which means refuge. The gates were open to wayfarers, amen, who have failed uh, in a manner that caused them to lose, amen, their life at the retribution of a slayer. Amen. For what they did accidentally. Not talk, now understand, they're not talking about you taking a knife and killing somebody. This is unwittingly somebody died at your hand. Maybe you're building a wall and, and the bricks fell and killed somebody. While the retribution was the next of kin would come and kill you. An eye for an eye, a, a tooth for a tooth. So it's these accidental things, manslaughter we call it now. And, and so th these these... People who did these things had a place to go to when they failed. God gave the Levites, uh, amen, or the spiritual overseers of Israel, the burden to operate these cities as they call sanctuary cities. They were to open their arms up and welcome, meanwhile, putting the arm of protection around the people. If somebody murdered, like I said, somebody by accident, to aim and retribution would come aim by the way of the victim's family or next of kin. The guilty would immediately find their way to the closest of these cities where we'd meet the elders and plead their cause. If the murder was deemed innocent, the slayer would be allowed to stay and live in the city until the high priest died. And then he can go home. Everything's, everything's said and done. So what does that mean to us? What, Pastor, why are you talking about this? There's an avenger out there. I said there's an avenger out there. 
He's not watching you so that you might accidentally kill somebody. He's not waiting for that brick wall to collapse on your neighbor's head. He's not waiting for a wanderer to trip in your ditch and find himself dead. But the Bible says he's roaming to and fro. I mean, he's seeking whom he may devour. The error is not the cause of death of a neighbor. The error is when we fail God. The time, like I said earlier, I mean, we all fail. And when you fail and come short of the glory of God, you're not doing it on purpose, hopefully. But you unwittingly fail. You're trudging up and down the dunes, and sand is between your toes, sand is in your ears, the sun is beating down, the pressure's on, and somebody comes along and says something wrong, and you snap at them. Or you do something else, and you to you, to, to somebody else they could do it, but to you it's sin. You're not out there, oh, get up in the morning, oh, it's 7 o'clock, the alarm's going up, beep, 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 beep. Okay, what, what can I sin today? <laughs> I'm planning on A, B, C, oh, I'm going to do D today. Tomorrow, it's supposed to be sunny out tomorrow, so I'll do A tomorrow. No, it's when we unwittingly sin. We understand the provisions of God forgiving us. We understand the mercy of God, but there's still an avenger out there, amen, going to and fro, waiting for you to trip up. Failure is not sin. Sin is what we do, amen, that causes a failure. There's a big difference. When we wittingly say, I'm going to sin, that is sin. When we fail God, that's still sin. But it's unwittingly. And the devil doesn't care what you do, how you do it, when you do it. He's out to get you. He's not going to come again with a red pitchfork and a tail and say, you bad boy. But he's going to come with thoughts to your head. He's going to come with circumstance around you. He's going to come with ideas to embellish you and make you worse than you are. He's going to come with an accusing spirit, accusing attitude, and you know yourself that you're laying in bed or by yourself and you know you did wrong and your conscience is eating you up. And you try to pray and there's a cloud over you. And you think God does not hear your cry. Come on. Am I preaching to the choir? Or am I preaching to myself? You see, the accuser of the brethren, he'll talk to God. And you know what the words of God, the thoughts of God, the response of God is? Uh, I, 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 I forgave him. I, I, I shed my blood for him. He's going to get nowhere in the mind of God. In the presence of God, he can go like he did to Job. Hey, have you considered my sermon, Job? God said. <laughs> well, you know what? He's like God. Uh, you know, he's only doing this because you're such a nice guy to him. You bless him, gave him power. Uh, you know, well, okay, try him. And the devils are, wow. I can't get anywhere here. So where does he go? He goes to the person he's talking about. Where did he go with Job? He didn't go to Job's attackers. He didn't go to the circumstance of the fire or the earth, whatever. He went to Job. So when the accuser of the brethren, you fail, he goes to God and says, Hey, did you see what poor Tim did? And the Lord said, yeah, I did. Have you considered him? <laughs> huh? So he comes back to Tim, and he sits on Tim's shoulder and said, you bonehead. <laughs> you know you're guilty of? And Tim said, yeah, I know. 
It's bugging me. Well, it should bug you, Tim. You're supposed to be a Christian. You call yourself a Christian? You call yourself a head of your family? You call yourself a board member? You call yourself blah, blah, blah. You, you built the pulpit. <laughs> I look at you now. <laughs> you actually built a cross. Oh, Tim. He's not going to get anywhere with God. So he turns back to Tim. And Tim's listening to this night and day, worse than a wife. <laughs> We'll leave it there. <laughs> We're going to edit that right out of the video. <laughs> Why did I say that? You see, the Avenger's a liar. He's a master of lies. He's out to get you, not so you can feel good, so he can destroy you. And God has set up a spiritual refuge so that not if you fail, when you fail, we can find this place in Him that we can hide and sit under His umbrella of protection. We're going to look at these cities and what they represent and what they mean to us. But before we go there, the path is always marked. You're always going to know how to get to the presence of God. You don't have to be, amen, a scholar because God has given you provision. Like I said, he's given instruction. He's given us the word. Amen. He's given us uh, instructors. He's given us, uh, amen, his spirit. He's given us his, his spoken word. Amen. So when we're going down a road that we've never been and we don't understand because we're so uh, blatantly bombarded by the enemy, uh, there's markers on the way uh, saying the refuge is this way. You go around the corner. You don't know what's around the corner. Your, your ears are filled with sand and heat and tired and worn out and you don't know and all of a sudden there's a marker the presence of God is this way it's this way oh but I don't know if I can make it you make it because it's made so you can make it doesn't matter where you are in the promised land you can make it to the city of refuge because you come into the presence of God and the elders are there may not be the elders but the presence of God is there and you plead your case you get on your knees oh God, I failed. I came short of your glory. Oh God, I tried. I tripped up. I was building a wall and the wall fell and I sinned. Oh God, I'm so sorry. I feel terrible. And the Lord is here with open arms. Say, come on in. The Avengers on the outside. He's speaking on the outside, but the gates are closed. You're under my protection. Then, whoo, ha, then we're going to deal with this. Come on into my office, Tim, and let's talk about it. Yeah, Tim, I got the record here. You messed up bad. <laughs> but you know what, Tim? My blood. My blood covers a multitude of sins. You are not made to be perfect. Amen. The day that you're, you're changed, the moment you're changed and immortality has come off or, or immortality has been put on. Amen. In eternity, that's when you will be perfect. Until that day, know assuredly there are cities of refuge that you can find yourself in. I want you to understand Israel did not build these cities. They did not plan these cities. God said, hey, Moses, tell Joshua, you're not there yet. You're still way back in the wilderness. You still got a few years to go, and you're not even going to be there, Moses. But tell Joshua, when he gets across to the promised land, he's going to build some cities, and there's six of them, and they're going to be called cities of refuge, and they're going to be owned and operated by the power and the anointing of God. Amen. They're not man-made. They're not man-dreamed. They came from the mind of God, these cities of refuge. You know why he did it? Because I know 
they're going to fail. Why? Why? Why is there a mercy of God? Because God knew we're going to fail. We beat ourselves up. We pulverize ourselves in prayer. Oh, God, forgive me. I've already forgiven you. And you know, anybody know God, know enough about God that he doesn't hold it against you? Tim, poor Tim. You know, you lift, you lift somebody up, right? And you got to bring him back down before his head explodes. <laughs> Tim, I'm giving you one more chance, and that's it. I don't hear, I don't read about that. There's going to come a time when God's going to turn his back. But that's not the second time you sin. The Bible says the only unforgivable uh, sin is when you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And I'm sorry, and I'm not going to stand here and, and tell a story. I'm going to tell it how it is. It's not easy to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. For people to say the Holy Ghost is not real. First of all, you have to have the Holy Ghost before you can say that and blaspheme God. Second of all, you've got to understand the attitude behind. Is somebody saying that because they're discouraged? Or are they saying that to be mean? Right? There's a difference. See, the Lord doesn't just look at face value. Oh, you said it. It's black and white. No, he looks at everything behind the scenes. Everything behind the scenes. And he judges accordingly. But his mercy is there. So these places of refuge were, were initiated by God and they were desired by God. Again, I did not ask, amen, for my salvation. I did not come to God and say, hey, God, how about saving my soul? I didn't. God worked on my heart and said, would you come to me, all ye, they're heavy laden. I will give you rest. Not one of us said, well, they got up in the morning and said, I'm going to go serve God. No. If you said that, it's because God was working on you for a long time. And you're just finally giving in. Because no man can come to him unless he calls you. Right from the first sin of Adam and Eve, God has been the one Amen. To seek a, a provision to provide a place of shelter and security for the sinner. Amen. Adam and Eve didn't want. God said, "Hey, are you here?" Well, no, we're hiding. Why are you hiding? Because uh, you know we're naked. Oh, well, how do you know you're naked? It wasn't them coming to God. Oh, forgive us. God said, "I'm here. Come out. Let's talk about it. I'm going to make provision for you." Now, whether, whether we as people take the place and enter into the city of refuge, just like the nation of Israel, if you, you don't have to, they didn't have to go to the city. They could have run the rest of their lives. The, the, that brick may have fallen off their house and killed somebody and said, well, oh, well, I'll deal. If they come after me, I'll deal with it. Oh, I'll move to another place, another town. We'll just up and move and build a wall somewhere else. They didn't have to. It wasn't like the Spirit picked him up like Elijah and carried him over to the city. It wasn't like that at all. Likewise, everybody say likewise. You don't have to come into the presence of God. You don't have to come into his provision. You can sin all you want. You can fail all you want and not repent. It's up to you. But when the avenger came after them, maybe the guy's walking down the streets of North Bay, and the avenger comes, and on the streets of North Bay, the guy loses his life because he chose. Instead of coming into where the safety is. You see, they had to make an effort, but the effort was always within reach. 
Amen. Because they saw, when they saw the seriousness of what happened, when I fall short of the glory of God, it's not a small thing. When I fail God, I've got to see the seriousness of it. Amen. Some cities were in the north, some were in the south. They were placed on each side of the Jordan. Obstacles were always cleared away. There was no storm for Dave to shovel the snow away. If there's any water on the road, they had to build a bridge over it. Make sure there's a bridge because we want nothing to stop them from coming. When we err today, we don't have to run, flee physically. But we do have to come with humility. Amen. Faith in our hearts to the King of Kings asking for his refuge. Psalm 34, 17, the righteous cry. And the Lord hears their cry, hears them, and keeps on hearing them, and delivers them, and keeps on delivering them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh to them that are of a broken heart, and save as such as a contrite spirit. Psalm 51, the sacrifice, I believe it was David, said the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, thou wilt not despise. What is it with David? David lied. David had an adulterous affair. David stole. David killed. And yet, in the eyes of God, he was a man after God's own heart. Why? Because David knew the sacrifices of God are of a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. So what about those who chose not to flee to the cities? They've unintentionally killed a man, but decided just to stay where they are. What became of them? There's no safety outside the cities. The nearest kinsman was upset, out for blood. Justice was coming. May not be today. Oh, it doesn't sound familiar. It may not be this hour. It may not be tomorrow. It may not be next week, next year. Who could tell? But they're always looking over their shoulder. Now understand the correlation here. Talk about the children of God. You may not want to come into the city of refuge. You may be so filled with pride in yourself that you don't need to come. But you're always going to look over your shoulder because there's going to come a day. Nobody knows the day nor the hour. It might come today. It might come tomorrow. It might come next week or next year. But you're always going to wonder when it's going to come. See, the church, the ones in the city, are looking for the appearing because it's such a blessing. But if we're not in the city of refuge, we're looking. Uh-oh. And some actually think, I can make it in the end. That Just before the hour! Look out. It's very, very dangerous. The avenger of blood is coming at some stage and the perpetrator was simply living on borrowed time. What a horrible, horrible position to be in. To be a people who have opportunity for safety and don't use it. The Bible calls them fools. Wow. What will eternity hold for those who heard the message and didn't respond? Every day for eternity, they're going to hear the same message over and over and over again. It's a recording that's not going to stop. I should have. 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 It's too late. 
For those who take advantage, the Lord is blessing and blessing and blessing again. Amen. The, even the names of the cities, and we're going to get into that next week. Each one had a, 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 a meaning and to us a spiritual implication. From the first steps, amen, that Israel took in Egypt through the wilderness, the Lord was with them helping them on the way. And as they entered the promised land, things change a little bit. I'm not only here with you. When we're in the church, you know, the Lord is out there all the time, isn't he? But when we come into him, it's more than he's here right now. It's more than reach out and touch him. He set some provisions for us. He's made a way for us. He's made a way of escape, protection, Amen. a way of wrapping his arms around us, holding and protecting us. Now they're entering the promised land. They're transitioning into who, who, who they're about to become. Amen. Once again, the Lord's hand was directing and helping them in the journey. I'm going to tell you something I'm very proud of. It's not a prideful thing, but I'm glad I'm in the church. I'm going to say it again. I'm glad I'm in the church. I'm glad I'm in the church. It's not just about coming to church. It's not just part of being a family of God. I have this relationship with God. And I'm not just me, us also. Matthew 6 25, his brother comes to the piano. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body. What you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not, not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to your stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow and toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30, wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, to, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall not he much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. Watch this. Instead of all that... Instead of worrying about all that stuff, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now remember last week we were talking about the, the attitude of, of outward towards inward? And he said, get rid of the inward. Well, the inward says, what am I going to wear? What am I going to eat? How am I going to make provision for my flesh? How am I going to take care of myself? And Jesus himself is saying, don't worry about that, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and what else? His righteousness or his, let me say his, yes. his right living. That's what it means. What does the Lord want from me. And he said, if you do this stuff, all these other things will be added to you. So therefore, take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. What does the Lord want? Do I want what he wants? Am I lining up with him on this quest, on this journey? I got to get my eyes off the mirror and put them on Jesus. Let's stand. Get them off my desire, my wishes, my wants, my ways. And put them on Him. Lord, here I am. What do you want from me, God? I, I, I'm humbled to come into this sanctuary city, this place of refuge. Lord, forgive me. Have mercy on me, God. Let's come. Let's pray. Let's seek the Lord today in Jesus' name.